So somehow I think there will be a few sort of like interesting discussions going on, uh, w which would be good. Um, I think if everyone is sort of like seated, we're, we're, we're good to go. Um, well, thanks for, for joining um, for a, a panel discussion. And I would sort of like, um, like to emphasize the discussion part. And I'm sure there will be plenty of discussion between the, the panelists, but um, also if there are questions or views or opinions um, from you guys here in the audience, uh, be sort of like keen to hear them and, uh, and, and of course, sort of like answer questions. Um, what I would like to do first is, um, I think most of you have already sort of like, sorry, is there a problem with the mic? Or? <laughs> blah blah. We can pass this one. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Oh, you're all okay. on. We're, Check. We're, we're good to go. Um, all right, so, so maybe very briefly an introduction of the panelists, because um, you've already heard um, some, of them, uh, some of them speak. So um, sort of like starting um, uh, sort of left to right, right to left, depending on where you're sitting. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got um, Marek, um, he uh, works at, um, at Jiwa. Uh, he's a senior um, game designer there. Very much involved um, in esports, as you probably gathered from the, the questions he has been asking, um, and a very sort of like a competitive player himself, um, sort of like Dota and StarCraft II, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Um, you've just heard uh, NASA speak. He's with the Jordanian um, Olympic Committee and the Jordanian uh, esports um, federation, if I got it correct, yeah. and also. Um, a gamer. And we've got Nabil, and I apologize for sort of like keeping it with first names because your surname was a bit of a, of a challenge for me. Um, he's with, uh, with Zabadi, um, who are sort of like organizing events and, and conferences and, and have their own sort of like gaming esport division, uh, of which uh, Nabil is in charge and uh, organizing lots of events in Kuwait and, and the Gulf region, and well, uh, maybe sort of like more. Uh, uh, sort of like further afield as well. Um, before kicking off um, sort of like the panel discussion, I had a few slides which hopefully right and left. Sorry. If I mean, if someone could get the slides up, that would be good. Um, as an events organizer myself, this is this is a nightmare. No, like for, for us, for the events organizers. I, I actually, we just yesterday had a live event in our mobile game, and literally everything went wrong. Yeah. So this feels like basically a replay of yeah. yesterday's. <laughs> it's it's. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's always. It's always guys, are you are you able to pull the slides up? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just wait for that then. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully. Now, let's see if this left and right actually works. That's great. Improvement. You want to start without slides? Um, yeah, I could, I, I, I could do that. Um, I mean, let's do that. Just give me one sec. Was this? So, I mean, starting without a slide. So you have to be sort of like a little bit creative, but speaking to hopefully sort of like a game designers and gamers, uh, creativity is not that much of a problem. Um, so the, the topic of the panel today is like how to join um, the eSports wave. Um, and first of all, I, I had a really cool slide about waves. I think we're there now. Um, Yeah, okay. I think we're getting there. Uh, yeah. So, um, 
I, I think it's sort of like no longer a discussion that sort of like esports is big. It's a wave. And it's all very cool and it looks very easy, but in fact, it's not so easy. Um, so, what kind of wave are we actually talking about? I mean, uh, we've heard people talk about monetization, and yes, monetization is still sort of in a way in its infancy. Um, I think you may have seen slides like this at, at conferences showing sort of like fairly big numbers of like how big is this market or how big will this market get. Um, what I find sort of like a lot more interesting in a way to sort of like see and show um, how esports has been evolving. Um, I don't have a slide, but it's just sort of like um, a little story. I was working with an esports company a couple of years ago, and two of the streamers that were working there, uh, French, uh, French streamers, um, they left, set up their own thing on Twitch, and they were doing quite all right. And at one point, they had the idea, um, Zerator and Dark, um, to do a Twitch marathon for charity. So they organized the Twitch marathon, two and a half days, invited lots of other Twitch streamers, and they did that, and they raised 170,000 euros. Not bad. Um, so they thought, well, this was a success. Uh, charity very happy. Um, so the year after, they did it again. And guess what? 500,000 euros for charity. Um, so this year, they thought, well, 500,000 euros for charity, that's going really well. Uh, so they did it again this year, um, and when they were done, uh, I sort of like saw, um, saw a thing on my Twitter from the French president, uh, Mr. Macron, who was congratulating them on raising three and a half million euros with a, a, sort of like a Twitch esports marathon. And to me, that sort of like tells a lot more than these numbers that sort of like research companies can put together, because it really shows the engagement. Uh, with players, uh, engagement with the community, and, and sort of like how fast this is growing. And clearly, uh, if, if there's so much money to be raised in something like a Twitch marathon, um, there must be sort of like money in the esports wave. So, again, not surprising that there's lots of people sort of like trying to jump on the esports wave, um, and that is everyone sort of like ranging from developers, publishers, league organizers, event organizers, uh, lots of media groups um, jumping onto this, um, as well as tech providers. And hopefully I'd like to hear a little bit more about whether we can at some point see the IOC sort of like joining the wave as well. Um, I don't know. Um, and the other question I would like to sort of like throw for the panelists a little bit later is, uh, are we talking about one wave? Is it, is there just, one thing like esports, or is esports sort of like a collection of a multitude of, of different things? And that's why the panel is here. Um, we can sort of like throw some questions at them. I, I was sort of like keen on doing that. Um, so maybe good to start off with Marek. Um, I mean, to show his sort of like dedication to esports, he's pretty sort of like hardcore esports nut. I mean, who would jump on a plane from Prague? having just organized a live event, uh, just to come here, have a talk, and then sort of like fly back today. Um, that's Marek. Um, so Marek, y you've been involved at, at Jiba, um, doing esports, um, esports on mobile, and you, you somehow managed to sort of like get to like 400 million views with um, your games. No, so, so Not quite there, but not we, quite there. Okay. we are moving to that direction. I think I can jump in right here. Yeah. Uh, just a short intro about myself, especially for the other panelists so they know. I started as a competitive player. I've competed on national level in multiple games. In StarCraft 2, I competed on international level. I, ha I was the co-owner of the biggest gaming place in the country. We had 80 computers. I've owned that for four years. Then I sold my stake and started making games. And right now, I make my living by developing PvP mobile games. But my passion really lies with esports. And as you said, uh, I did just uh, do a massive life event in our country in our mobile game. But I, I'm, I'm always willing to debate esports. And when I seen the opportunity to debate someone on actual Olympic committee uh, on the live event, there was a no-brainer. 
even when it means I will not sleep for the next 36 hours. So there are investments to everything. And on behalf of my country, where we try to convince them to consider esports, or even before esports, I try to convince them with chess, and they are really reluctant to even open that conversation, I'm very surprised and pleasantly surprised that you have much further and much more open-minded approach towards that. Uh, regarding the waves that you mentioned, I would say that if you are a developer, it's not a wave that you want to jump on. Uh, majority of the eSport games that exist and make a lot of money are really old. And a few exceptions are either completely funded by the developers, something like Overwatch, or before Smite and Heroes of the Storm, both of them are discontinued already because the developer ends up kind of paying the players to play the game, which is not a healthy scenario. Or, of course, if you are anomaly like uh, Fortnite, you can invest $200 million over the next year and you will have your eSport regardless. So is there a way for developers to jump on it easily? Yes, but prepare a proper war chest. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. So may I, within, with, to, to discuss two parts, the wave and to discuss the IUC. I'll start with the argument regarding the IOC and um, Olympic committees and uh, government recognition of um, esports. Well, this is something that um, not a lot of people um, have given a lot of attention to in Jordan, but one of the reasons why the Jordan Olympic Committee is the actual representatives of esports in Jordan is because we're trying to send a message. The message we are trying to send to the international community and to our local community is that we are supporting it because we understand that we have a lot of athletes in Jordan who play the sport. So we cannot not look at a fact. We have numbers. We have numbers on the ground. We have top athletes. We might as well be part, join something that, that's, that is organically successful. So we have a lot of athletes in that. We should have representation for that and an umbrella for that. And we are having an issue with the International Esports Federation, IESF, because it is the first time an Olympic committee has applied to become a member directly as an Olympic committee. They're saying you need to, it's nobody, no Olympic committee has requested this because usually they try to lo lobby with Olympic committees. But I have a major community in Jordan. I cannot leave them unrepresented. And this is why we have um, the committee within the Olympic Committee, and we've done that ahead of time. Um, regarding the IOC um, um, and regarding the WAVE. Mm -hmm. So the IOC, the, uh, a, a good friend, um, um, his name is Patrick Bowman, sadly now the late Patrick Bowman. Patrick Bowman was the Secretary General of uh, FIBA, which is the International Basketball Association and also was the president of something called Sport Accord, or, the, or GAFE, as it's called today, which is the General Assembly of all international federations, was the main guy within the IOC who was pushing for, um, for the IOC to join the WAVE. Okay? Sadly, he passed away during um, the Youth Olympic Games in Argentina last year, and that has slowed down um, because a lot of people look at it in a traditional way and what I was discussing regarding sports, that um, jumping on the wave has decreased. Though, most of the people who want the IOC to join the wave are making a very valid argument with a one major argument. If you do not, if you don't join the game now, the game will be, the game or esports will be, become, maybe one day become bigger than the Olympic Games themselves. So you might as well organize it right now. And this is an argument that I've been making. You might as well join now, even if it is just to be able to be part of the regulation, to be able to regulate it and how, it how you become part of it, because the wave is too big and could be bigger than you in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that's uh, what I had to say right now. Go ahead. Uh, to, to add on to the, uh, the uh, involvement on a governmental level with, with uh, eSports, uh, this is something uh, that I honestly um, was surprised by, that we have someone, a, a country in the, Arab, in the Arab world that has taken that initiative and, and is pushing forward and is trying to, to achieve an unprecedented uh, achievement 
uh, whereas where I, I speak, I speak on, on, uh, from uh, a Kuwaiti standpoint, it's um, the furthest, furthest thing from, from coming to reality. And uh, just right now, uh, we, are in the, we are in the process of setting up a federation, uh, an esports, a Kuwaiti esports federation, which will hopefully become a stepping, a, a stepping stone towards achieving uh, more uh, organized or structured uh, regu uh, regulatory boards for esports. Um, to, to add about riding the wave, it's, it's, it's a massive wave, and it, just grab your surfboard and jump, jump in because it's, it's one hell of a ride, and, and it's something that we, uh, we are enjoying, and it's something that we... Uh, we're learning every day. We're we're uh, uh, we're we're part of it now, and yeah. we we just want to see it through. We want to make sure that we deliver the best we can deliver from 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 uh, from that sta from that point. And like I said, we're learning every day because yeah. there's so much to learn. There's so much to there's there's it's it's a vast uh, uh, field of information and. Uh, Meeting people like yeah. Merrick will also help us uh, understand a little bit better, uh, perhaps. I have one question, uh, especially regarding the Olympic body, because in Europe we had a big um, history of something that was basically European Championship, VSCC, and we found a very interesting problem in Europe, especially with team games, because uh, usually in team games, whether it's Counter Strike, Dota, League of Legends, the teams are not from one country. The games kind of break the borders. We have members from all over. The and when we had the European Championship, one of the problems was that the games were not at the highest skill level because the teams that are usually normally playing together, they couldn't play together because of different nationalities. And every time this body has reached some form of traction, because the games were not played at the highest level, what ended up, it, it lost the viewership. People, players or the viewers were rather watching the normal matches in the uh, organic tournaments as ESL or something in the States, rather than watching the European Championship just because the level of the play wasn't as high. Isn't that something that worries you with bringing the Olympic Committee, which is just based on the nationality, especially for the team-based games? Because you will have players like Miracle that will play in his team in Dota, where it's built, let's say, out of five nationalities, but then he will need to make a national team to compete on the Olympic stage. Is that something that you thought about while doing this entire process? Uh, we're, it's too early to even reach that level of discussion and that level of worry because as many of the people who have, have dealt with us and dealt with esports in Jordan or at the Olympic level, um, we didn't even, we're not even within that realm of discussion of whether what's going to be the final product will be interesting enough or not. We're just hoping that it becomes a discussion in the first place <laughs> that nations can be represented. Now, there's a note here. Miracle or others would be very interested to play at the highest level if it was to be organized by a top body like the IOC. Why? Not for only the financial return, because the governments will pay their athletes to play, but more or less for the international recognition if they wanted it. So if you had the chance as a gamer to go and get an Olympic medal for your country, you will think twice about it. You might say, you know what, I'm more interested in money, but sometimes you say, why not? My amount of time invested, I'm training already, I might as well play for my country and be able to be on that equal stage with other athletes from other sports like athletics. Does that make sense? Well, like, sadly, Czech Republic kind of disproves this argument with ice hockey. We, are, we have some really good ice hockey players that play in the NHL and KHL, but when they are supposed to play for the national team, they just can't be ours because there is no money. So from a standpoint, like, I want to believe what you are saying, but from the at least historic country that I represent on this panel, we do not do that. I, I, think, I think that uh, having, having national teams represent, representing the country in esports is important. Um, and like you said, you have different teams that are based in Europe, Asia, the States, that are a collection of the best talent that, are, that is available to, to, to represent the team in, in, in the respective games. So, um, like you said, you have them playing in the NHL, you have them playing in the best leagues in the world, but when they come back, they, they, they should compete for their country, for the name of their country. And which also goes back to the stage of you saying 
there's no money being being paid in it. Again, this is, I believe, a responsibility for the mm -hmm. national bodies that are creating these yeah. teams to provide them with the funding, to provide them with the necessary resources, uh, to yeah. exactly to because if 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 a team exists, if a, a, a League of Legends Jordanian team exists, and you have Jordanian players playing in Korea and the states and around the world. And if it's Jordan's responsibility to bring these people to, uh, people to play for the national team, same applies for different countries as well. It's not, it's, it's, um, yeah. Can, 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 I, can I run maybe sure. a, a little experiment here? Because w w w what I'm hearing is, um, yes, it's still sort of like very early in the discussion. Um, sort of like in an Olympic setting, we'd be sort of like talking national teams. And yes, those teams might not be as good as sort of like call it normal pro teams, but then again, the, the counter-argument could be, well, um, would it be more engaging or less engaging for, for viewers uh, and esports enthusiasts to see sort of like players from their country to sort of like do really well in a tournament? Could that be as much fun as just watching the best match? I mean, I could watch a Premier League football and it could be really, really great, and I could be supporting my national team might not be as good, but it could still be fun. It could be a different experience. So I'm curious for, like, from the audience, would you rather see the best team or would you rather see, or, or would you equally be happy to see your national team compete at the highest level at an Olympics? And, and, and then also like to have your views on that. So, so hands up, who would, who would love to see only the best teams or who would love to see sort of like their country's best players on an international stage and getting recognition? Like, well, best teams, or...? <laughs> I would say that I'd like to see them both, just like I like to watch Champions League for best football matches. Yeah. But we also watch World Cup, which is for national teams. Mm -hmm. It's not the, most, the best football being played, but you have that national pride on, on the line. Uh, I, like, uh, personally, I, I, I was watching the tournaments that were on national basis. But all I'm just saying that in history we already had a similar body that tried to organize such thing in Europe and it always over time lost more and more viewership. That I'm not representing my personal view. I love watching our players to get completely destroyed in games because we are a really small country and that limits the pool of players. But uh, that doesn't change the fact of what already happened. So I'm just like pointing out that this is not for the first time we're discussing this in the history of esports. Uh, I think I think uh, what you're saying is correct, and it's it's something that people that you should be worried about if anything uh, ever comes up with with a similar strategy or a similar formula. Uh, but it's it's I, in my opinion, it's okay to try something and fail, and then learn from those experiences to to move forward with a better with a better uh, better thing. Uh, just one last comment to that. Sorry, is that. Uh, a lot of games, especially team-based games, have actually marketed themselves as they break the borders. Mm -hmm. it, and this is something that goes directly against this nationality base, mm -hmm. which is, I think, another uh, like step to overtake in this process. Because uh, I, I know definitely that the international has really marketed in Dota in a way that they have teams based on multiple players of multiple nationalities and even League of Legends with Riot Games. That they are really proud of the fact that they, it's a diverse platform for people all over the world. But the breaking borders part also works on teams from different countries playing across borders against each other. So it's a multi-argument. It does not mean that the players on the same team need to be different. Anyways, argument and counter arguments there. Yeah. I just want to go back to the wave. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about this more from a business sense. Um, the wave does exist. I go back to the same argument of monetization. Entering into the esports market, well, many of our jo the Jordanian investors in this have faced this, is just like entering into any sector, into the food market, into uh, the IT market, into any standard sector. You need, you need to have proper business plans, you need to see how you're going to monetize, you need to see how you're going to profit, what are you going to spend money on. And I think this is sometimes lost within the model um, on how tough it is to make money out of this wave. Um, it's not an easy market. It's actually one of the toughest markets. Yes, there's a lot of attention. There's a lot of viewership. 
there's a lot of people playing, there's a, there's a huge community, but that does not mean there's a lot of money for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one area of argument, and Zawi is preparing with Nabil to, to give a comment there, and I'm sure others, many of our local investors will tell you the same. It's not an easy market, it's not something to jump into. Um, you need to study every single step and be very organized in how you can be sustainable in this market. Go ahead. Uh, if you, if yeah. you uh, look back at the pie chart that you showed us and it had about 49% of it was, uh, was sponsorship. And uh, 42, sorry, 42% 40, uh, was sponsorship. Uh, what's, what are these sponsors making out of spending $450 million into sponsoring esports. There isn't really a tangible return on investment with, with, uh, with their sponsorship here. So it's, it's, it's mostly an investment in, in the youth and capturing a segment of the market that's going to mm -hmm. probably uh, have uh, brand loyalty, wh whatever it may be. Um, uh, building on what uh, Nasser was saying is monetization is a very crucial part of it and it's a very difficult part uh, to, to, uh, to achieve. Um, these, these sponsors, they spend crazy amount of money and most of the time they make nothing in return. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is, a, this is a, uh, an argument we have with a lot of the companies we work with. And they tell us, okay, I'm, I'm going to spend with you this amount of money. Well, what are you going to give me back in return other than the event that you're going uh, to be organizing for us? So this is where we start to uh, bring, in, uh, bring in different discussions like, okay, you're going to be capturing a specific age group from this, group, from this age to that age. And these are your, new, your future potential uh, uh, customers. Depending, if it's a bank, for example, what, what is a bank going to benefit from 13 to, 15, uh, to, to 18 year olds other than opening up the youngster accounts? Uh, th this is, this is a, a struggle that we face when, when, whenever, we, whenever we're invited into pitch for something or, dis or have that discussion. And it's a very, very important part to uh, it's very important for us to uh, know exactly how we can make the best, uh, uh, the best out of it, make, make the most money out of it by giving back the best quality that we can as well. Yeah, and and so you, do, do you see sort of like I mean I am uh, I mean we've got the sort of like the Middle East and the European perspective here. I mean, do you see big differences in how the monetization is being approached? Um, I mean, you mentioned bank accounts. I mean, some of the companies we were involved in, they were doing just that, banks and telcos were using esports to reach an audience that they would otherwise find more difficult to sort of like engage with and, and get them to open accounts, get them to get credit cards and, and, and subscriptions to the mobile services. I mean, do you see big differences in also within the region? Like, how do sponsors look at it and how does that affect how events or tournaments are being organized? Um, is it like one approach for the whole market or is it sort of much more um, segmented? It's, it's, the way we do it is we try to personalize it with every client that we approach. And a lot of our clients are actually surprised when we suggest collaborating with a different sponsor. And uh, they're, 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 not usually, they're not usually prepared to respond. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> no worries. It's mobile gaming, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would just look at it from the it's base, especially about. based on this graph where you see that the growth is like 34%. Uh, is what is interesting in that that if you look like five years ago, majority of the sponsors for esports were sellers of uh, um, peripherals like Steel Series, Razer, true, true. Uh, companies that could directly monetize uh, supporting these Software events. and hardware. Software and hardware, exactly. Intel and, and just in the recent years, we see the upcoming of the big investors like Coca-Cola, Mercedes. Yes. We see football teams buying actual esports teams. Yes. Because uh, and I think that's the other part that you already mentioned. It's targeting that very specific demographic that's almost untar untargetable by any other channel of media which is very certain, very specific male audience between age X and Y. I think we're wrapping up, but I've got a note. Um, Hamad, uh, I think from a local perspective, and Hamad has a lot of experience with the local scene, um, I don't think our events are getting in a lot of sponsorship money. Not enough. Am I right or am I wrong? Thank you. 
low budget that they have. And this is actually the wall that we, we've been trying to break for the, the past five years. Oh, let me just add to mm -hmm. that. So this automatically takes out of this pie locally, takes out sponsorship. Sponsorship, the total sponsorship market for all of sports in Jordan does not go beyond two to three million dollars a year for all of sports. So all sports across does, do not get, federation wise, do not get more than two to three million total. So take sponsorship out of this pie. Advertising, nobody sees the return on investment unless it's online and global. Take advertising out of that one. Merchandising and tickets, I'm not going to even have that discussion. Media rights, again, if it's not online, it's mm -hmm. not going to work. And game publisher fees. Listen, in general, this pie, if I was to look at it at the, in the Jordanian market, does not apply today. Mm -hmm. And its lack of, the fact that it doesn't apply makes the job of a committee or the sector much tougher to find alternative monetization model for our local market mm -hmm. or to make the return on investment sexier for uh, sponsors and advertisers, but in a bad economic market, that's quite a tough argument to be made. Uh, yeah. I think something we didn't touch on here is uh, whenever Marek is speaking, he's talking about Europe. And then whenever we're speaking, we're talking about Kuwait, we're talking about Jordan, we're talking about Dubai. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's time that, uh, to, to progress forward and to actually get where we all want to reach. We need to, uh, in, in, in my opinion, and I speak on behalf of my company and my, and, my, and my partners, is we need to be more collaborative with each other and we all need to have a similar goal and work together towards achieving that goal. And steps need to be taken, the right steps need to be taken, which already Jordan have, have, have uh, done by, achieve, by creating the uh, Jordan Esports uh, Committee, Saudi Arabia have it, and uh, the UAE have it, and... Uh, Kuwait is in the progress, and I think this this is this is a good a good start for uh, for moving forward towards having a Middle Eastern body that can govern uh, govern such uh, uh, such events. Because as a market, when when you look at the market size, the Middle East is 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 a massive market, and however, when you break it down individually, it it, it trickles down into four, four five, six million uh, people per per market, and. That's where the sponsorship money can start coming in, when it's more, more, a more cohesive system. And I'm going to use the word ecosystem here because there, it, it's, it's, it's lacking in, in this part of the world. Uh, many, different, uh, many different elements need to all gel in together for us to be able to start talking about $450, $450 million of sponsorship or anything close to it in this part of the world. Even, it's not just, it's not just a, a Jordanian uh, struggle, it's a struggle we face in Kuwait as well. It's a struggle that even if we, we, we started, we just recently entered into the UAE market, and it's not as, 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 as glamorous as, as pe pe people make it, make it. No, because uh, we, we, we have the same... Okay, that, that <laughs> because we had the same, we had the same uh, uh, impression about entering the UAE market. That it's going to be uh, all, all, all the all the hardware companies are based there, the software companies are based there. We started knocking doors. Sorry, no budgets. Oh, we don't want money. We want screens. Sorry, we can't give you screens. Okay, next company, next company, next company. And we've knocked on so many doors, and everyone has the same same response. We don't have the budget. Uh, it's, it's, but it's I mean, a isn't that a little bit sort of like how things sort of like started in in Asia and Europe? I mean. Uh, at some point, there was not much of an infrastructure or ecosystem, and there were sort of like a few companies sort of like pushing it out there, starting to organize tournaments in an organized way. And on the back of that, and that has taken time, um, it started to grow. I mean, um, Marek, if you want to yes, add on that, for, for sure. Like, uh, if I look back at like 2002, 2003, when we were organizing the first events in the country and we were going door by door, exactly what you are describing, we went to NVIDIA and asked. Like, we want 80,000 Czech crowns, we just transfer like, what, 2,000 euros, 2.5 thousand, which is nothing. But we wanted some support. And it took us a very long time to develop some relationships when we first got like 20 graphic cards for price money. And then we went to Intel. And we kind of slowly built these relationships that peaked at some point of returns. And now I think the overall investment into esports by those big companies, Samsung, um, Intel, and peripherals, hardware and software, is around five to six million dollars. 
But we are a small country, so it looks quite living and healthy. But it took a very long time. And I think what you described, if you separate the Middle Eastern countries and don't, do not look at it as a region, then you kind of look at, find that Jordan is a really small market. It, the same thing would kind of happen in Europe. I mean, in Europe, Sweden, Germany, and Poland are the strongest esport markets. And if you would put them out and look at every single European state separately, it would also look super weak. But nobody is speaking about esport in single given state. We are always speaking about esport in the whole region. I think partially because traveling is so easy in, our, mm -hmm. in, in Europe. It, it, really, nobody cares if the tournament is played in Denmark or is, if it's in France, in Paris. Everybody is just like, this is a tournament we do in, that, uh, in, the, in the region. <laughs> yeah. Just look like looking at time. We time for questions. Okay. So I'm, I mean, this is your opportunity. I would say, so anything you wanted to ask about esports, I must add. Um, the, the guys are here now. Um, so I'd like to give the opportunity for questions here. I think the questions happened during. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you guys are working on mobile esports. Yes. Where do you see mobile esports? How do you uh, how how uh, how big do you see mobile esports becoming in the next five years? Well, the first thing that I would like to avoid is comparing it to the PC esport. I don't think one will overlap the other. I think I it's know, I'm not, two. I'm, I'm, not I'm just trying yeah. to state that for the audience that it will be two separate branches. If we look at China, uh, I already mentioned today PUBG. PUBG Mobile is four times the size of PUBG PC which I learned just like two months ago and I was shocked by it. So I think uh, mobile eSport will be really big, especially in the Asian regions, but we are kind of slowly getting there even in the European and the, the rest of the Western world. I think a good example is Clash Royale. Mm -hmm. However, when I was in Helsinki two months ago and I've discussed with some of the people that are behind the Clash Royale League, which is the biggest mobile eSports in Western world as of now, they are not actually so far evaluating it as a success. They are simply using eSport as a marketing tool to prolong longevity of already monetizable product because they still rake up 1.5 billion of revenues every year with the game. And they are just trying to prolong the state when the game is relevant. So I think in the Western world, we have a long way to go and it will be a very difficult path. But in the, in the Asian world, where there is already a generation of players that never played on PC or consoles, they, are only, played, they only played games with tablet or mobile, I think there we will see insane amount of growth. And uh, I think, although I'm not a passionate mobile competitive gamer, I will be very honest, I love my PC games, my old PC games, I'm very conservative in this. Uh, I'm still looking forward, uh, not as a player, not as a, maybe not even as an organizer, but as a viewer. All right, now the million dollar question is, what about the new streaming on demand gaming services? Do you think those will be popular with esports? Like the Google Stadia and the Xbox services no. and the Apple Arcade? No, not in, a, not in the next you, 20 years. Do you see it translating from mobile to, to, to those uh, services? No, I don't believe in those services. I think those services are gimmicks to scam investors. Okay. <laughs> That's... <laughs> it's a billion dollar question. <laughs> I, I think it's always good to sort of like leave it with a, a very sort of like clear and stark comment. <laughs> um, all right, well, thanks very much, guys, for Thank sharing you. your insights. Thank you for inviting us. All right, cheers.